Good mid-morning. How many of you have ever had God perform a miracle in your life? God is so good. Nobody can tell me there is no God. I have seen him work miracle after miracle in my own life and in my family's life. There is a God, and he is alive. So we're going to turn and sing page 68. He lives. Page 68. Let's sing it with gusto. <clears throat> I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him.
Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to be here this morning. God, we thank you for the messages that have inspired us, for those that have challenged us, for those that just brought us on a little bit more to greater maturity and growth into you. So, Father, as we come to this meeting this morning, we ask that you would foster within us teachable hearts and spirits so that way we can leave you with that little nugget of golden truth that you would have us to receive so that way we can go out and share the wealth with those that we come into contact with. So we thank you for your promise to be here in our midst this hour is our prayer and majesty. Once again, we welcome you here to Camp 2015 for the Gulf States Conference here on the campus of Bass Memorial Academy. So we want to thank those who are here in our live audience, and we want to uh, thank those that are joining us online as well. Uh, again, it is my absolute honor and privilege uh, to welcome uh, to the platform this morning Elder Richie Hoverson, a uh, pastor at the College Drive Church. In Jackson, Mississippi. Good morning, good church. Good morning. Not as good, amen. 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 Praise, Praise the Lord, Lord for each one of you. What a blessing it is to worship God, to come together, and explore His word. There's power in the God, amen. Blessing study. I've been blessed, blessed by the various meetings that I've had the privilege of being able to check out, and it's just been such a blessing. blessing. I did want to mention, I'm going to do a, a very brief, shameless self promotion. Uh, not really self promotion, but I have put some flyers there on the table. Uh, I'll be hosting a reformation tour uh, in 2016 that is for the lay people. Uh, I know the, the conference, we're, we're hoping, looking forward to doing one for pastors and teachers in 2017, but this is for lay ministers, lay pastors, and, and, and uh, just want you to know that we'll be doing that in 2016. There's some flyers with some more information about that. It's going to be exciting. I'll be doing daily devotions, and as we go along that track that Luther took, and as he took a stand for the word of God. So it's going to be a powerful tour. You do not want to miss it. If you can be a part of it, I'd love for you to come. And we can worship and study the word of God uh, together. So some more information is, is, is there on the table. But again, I just praise God for being here. I love Gulf States Conference. It's my favorite conference. It's the best conference. And uh, I just see God leading in so many different ways. Uh, in every aspect, a revival here. And I've been to many different conferences and grew up going to many different conferences. And, and I tell you, Gulf States, uh, the Holy Spirit is moving. Amen? And we want it to continue uh, to grow and, and move. Keep uh, the Ridge Seventh-day Adventist Church in your prayers. We planted a church in, uh, it was, uh, I guess, March uh, that we planted that church and March 7th, you know, uh, when I was picking, when me and the team were picking a date, I said, we're, we're picking a date on, on the 7th, because 7 is the number of perfection, amen? Completion, and God's got to complete this, and so keep the ridge in your prayers, please, as, as a new church plant, as we do evangelism, and that God will continue to bless and grow that church, and know that you all are in our thoughts and prayers as well. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, we praise you for the awesome God that you are. Lord, we come to you humbly, simply seeking you. Whenever we open the word of God, we, we need to come opening it for just more of you. When we come to you in prayer, we just come for more of you. May our worship and everything that we do be all about you. Hide me behind your cross, 
pour out Your Spirit on these, Your people. Empower us to be the church that You have called us to be because the King we know is coming soon. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Eat this book. Revelation, the 10th chapter. Notice what the Bible says. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and do what? Come on, Adventists, you know this text, right? Take it and do what? Eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Verse 10, and I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth, and when I had eaten it, it made my stomach, what? Bitter. And I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. There is a story about a German artist named Albrecht Dreuer. Albrecht Dreuer who created this famous drawing, The Praying Hands. Albrecht's father was a goldsmith, and he was trained as a goldsmith and, and trained his son to be a goldsmith, but Albrecht's passion was to be an artist. His father was wealthy, wasn't wealthy enough to support him in his education and becoming an artist, and so Albrecht Dreuer had to work. <clears throat> the trouble was, this left little time to perfect his art of painting. Albrecht had a friend named Franz who was also a gifted artist. And in the same boat, they both didn't have much money to go through school and, and, and to, to really perfect that art. And so what they decided to do was they would draw lots. And, and the one who, who <clears throat> won would go away to school and the one who lost uh, would... would, would work and help support the other to go through school. And they drew lots, and Albrecht won. Years later, Albrecht returned to keep his end of the bargain. But he had soon discovered the sacrifice his friend had made for him. As Franz had worked at his job, his fingers became twisted and stiff. His long, slender fingers had been ruined for life. No longer able to make the delicate brush strokes necessary for painting. And yet in spite of the price that he had pray, paid, Franz was not bitter. He was happy that his friend Albrecht had attained success. And so one day Albrecht saw his friend kneeling. His rough hands folded in prayer. And Albrecht quickly sketched the hands, later using the sketch to create his drawing, the praying hands. <clears throat> he saw his friend's hands as a symbol of the sort of love that Jesus had shown us, a self-giving love, a, a self-emptying love. A self-emptying love that shows servanthood over equality with God and the glory of heaven. You see, friends, things can happen to you in your life that can leave your mind, it can leave your thoughts, it can leave your life gnarled and twisted just like Franz's fingers. And you have a decision. You can ultimately respond in two ways. You can become bitter or you can continue to serve God recognizing he will one day make everything that is wrong right, turning the bitterness into sweetness. But nowhere in Scripture does God promise this life to be free of pain. You know that. You've experienced that. In fact, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Hardships in the contract for Christians. In fact, at, at, at times, God even asks us to swallow a pretty bitter pill. Or in the case of Revelation 10, a bitter book. Seven is a popular number in Revelation. 
Uh, we know that seven represents, we say seven is the number of perfection, but a better word is completeness. Seven represents completeness. Uh, there are seven churches, and we've got seven seals in Revelation, and we've got seven trumpets. We even have seven plagues. In the Bible, the seven represents completeness. Uh, God created the earth in, 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 in six days and rested on the seventh. It was finished. It was finished. Revelation is all about God completing his work in you and me. The churches and the seals and the trumpets are all examinations of the church down through history. And the seven plagues, the consequence of violation of God's perfect law. And friends, if you pick up any newspaper, if you turn on the television set, you will see it littered with the consequences of a world that has violated the law of God. And so much bad is happening, it can cause you to question the goodness of God. When you look at the state of the world, it can cause you to question the goodness of God. A time when, when no one is willing to stand up for anything and everybody is willing to fall for everything, each of us has to ask ourselves the question posed in Revelation 6, 17, for the great day of their wrath has come, who can what? Because you see, friends, if I go through this life and if I go through all the pain and the heartache and I live through all the temptations, the, 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 the tax audits and the addictions and the death, and I find that in the end I cannot stand, man, what is the point? Something good has to come out of all of this bad. How in the world can we ever stand? Well, I want to let you in on a little secret. The reality is, you cannot stand. Jude tells us how we can stand. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. You see, the real message of Revelation is no matter how bad things get, God still is in control. That no matter how dark it is today, there is a glow, hallelujah, on the eastern horizon. And yet it still isn't easy to celebrate when your home is falling apart. And it's not so easy to say amen when your child has been killed by a drunk driver. It isn't so easy to say hallelujah to the saint who says all things work together for good for those who love the Lord when, 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 when your spouse leaves you. When your house is destroyed by a tornado, when you can't find a job, when you can't pay your bills, we don't shout amen so loudly then, do we? And yet there is a pattern in Revelation that resonates hope. A pattern emerges amidst the scary scenes among the armies of locusts with lion teeth and the beasts of the land and sea. Hallelujah, the pattern that keeps showing up is that Jesus keeps showing up. At the end of the seven churches, Jesus shows up. In chapter 4, when no one is worthy to open the scroll, Jesus shows up. And in the seventh seal and at the sound of the seventh trumpet, Jesus shows up. When, whenever something bad happens in Revelation, when evil looks like it's about to win, hallelujah, Jesus shows up right in the nick of time. So even if you feel nothing can go right in this world, hallelujah, Jesus is going to show up and he's going to make things right. The king is coming and he's determined to save you for eternity. You see, that's what's awesome about God. God only sees in terms of eternity. And so when God looks at you, he's looking at you in terms of eternity. When he looks at you, he's not focusing on where you are. He's focusing on where he plans on taking you. That's how, that's how Jesus could give power to disciples 
One was about to deny him. Jesus gives him power. One was about to betray him. Jesus gives him power. Uh, two of them were gangbangers. One of them was a terrorist. One of them was a racist. Why? How in the world could Jesus ever do that? How in the world could Jesus ever use me? Well, because when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't look at where you are today. He looks at where he's about to take you. He sees the potential. He sees the person he originally created you to be. You see, we need to start living in the light of eternity, amen? We need to live in the light of eternity. You see, living in the light of eternity may not remove the pain, but it allows us to have hope in our moments of pain. So even on your worst day, Jesus is with you. You see, God has guaranteed you a future that will be con completely devoid of pain. And so that's how you can make it. See, we need to know that even on our worst day, Jesus is still with us. Even on our worst day, you're still owned by God. The message of Revelation is that Jesus can keep you spiritually. You see, friends, the number seven is a promise God will finish what he started. If, as long as we're willing to submit. And sometimes I hear these things about pastor compromise in the church and Babylon in the church and, and, I, and I hear these things and yes, we know these things will appear in the church but the greatest compromise we have in the church is we are not preaching the love of Christ to the world. The seven churches of Revelation tells me that even in the roller coaster ride of the church, Jesus is going to finish what Jesus started. Keep your eyes on Christ. And he's going to get you through. Uh, he can keep us in the church, the seven seals. He can keep us in this crazy world, seven trumpets. And so it's with that understanding that we build on Revelation chapter 10, verse 9. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, it made my stomach bitter. Now what is the function of a book? Knowledge, right? Education. We read a book in order to gain information. And, and when you read a book, I don't know about you, man. When I sit down and I read a book, I'm just all into that book. And, 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 and I, the word that comes to mind when I think of myself reading a book is I'm consuming it. You're basically consuming it. You are what you consume. By beholding, we become changed. You eat food, it becomes a part of you, and we grow, right? You, you, you consume uh, uh, material, it, it becomes a part of you, and you grow. When you read a book, in essence, in essence, you are eating the book. What is this book John asks for? Well, let's read in verse 2. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now, in prophecy, the sea represents densely populated areas. Many of us know that. Uh, we get this from Revelation 17, 15, among other places. And the angel said to, to me, the waters that you saw are people and multitudes, nations, and languages. The earth represents scarcely populated areas. So this angel's message has a message that is relevant to the entire planet. Because the angel is standing on the sea, highly populated areas, and land. Scarcely populated areas. It is a message for the entire world. Notice verse 3. And I called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, there were what? Seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders sounded... I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. 
Now, throughout Revelation, you read it in the very beginning, throughout Revelation, John is told to write what he sees and what he hears. But then you get to Revelation 10, and just before John's about to write it down, he hears a voice from heaven saying, don't write it down. And I was studying this subject, and I came across this quote from Manuscript, Volume 19. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to what? Future events events which will be disclosed in their order. So John is showed this book, but is told not to write about it. You see, friends, what you need to understand is Christians, there are things that are going to happen to you that God cannot reveal to you before they happen, because if he did, you would run in the opposite direction. Daniel referred to a time of trouble in Daniel 12, 1, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. And friends, when I look at the history books, there have been some very troubling times. And Daniel, and what, and what we're, we're, we're told in Daniel is, those things have nothing on what's coming. Things are going to happen to you in your life that you cannot stop. Hardships and times of trouble that you've never experienced before. Times of testing when all you can do is hold on for dear life. Times that may have started out sweet, but they turned bitter. Hardships, disappointment, tragedy, painful events that when they happen, really all you can do is eat it. When you first came into the church and you heard the truth, man, it was sweet. But when your family disowns you and your employer fires you, bitter. When you meet Jesus for the first time and you taste what it is you've been missing, sweet. But because you don't do some of the things that you used to do before you met Jesus, suddenly you're not so popular anymore, bitter. You marry your high school sweetheart. That's sweet. But now... It's bitter. When God first called me to follow him, it was sweet. But he did not tell me some of the things that I would have to go through along the way. Bitter. Planting a new church sounded exciting. Sweet. But then real work begins and sometimes it's bitter. Evangelism sounds fun in the beginning. Sweet. But then there's times and ups and downs in evangelism where it feels bitter. Finding the truth is sweet, but sometimes staying in the church can sometimes be bitter. And that's why we need to learn to depend and and build our lives on Jesus Christ. We need to keep our eyes on him in the good times and the bad times, because the just shall live by faith. You see, John could not write down what he heard. He couldn't share what he heard. God just tells him to eat it. We say we want greater faith, we want greater patience, we want greater perseverance, but we do not want to go through what it takes in order to get those things. We say we want the church to grow, but we are not willing to commit to the kind of service mentality it's going to take in order for the church to grow. We want people to change and be clones instead of allow ourselves to be changed and make disciples. You see, coming and listening to good sermons at camp meeting may be sweet. And going home and implementing the things that you learn, now that's going to be tough, that's bitter. We say things like, we want to know what tomorrow holds. But God knows if he were to tell you what tomorrow holds, man, you wouldn't get up out of bed. Our tendency is to always take the easier path. We will always take the easier road. If I'm given the option of the easier road, I'm taking the easier road. 
Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are how many? Many. God always sends us exactly what we need, amen? He sends us what we need, but what we so rarely have enough sense to ask for. You see, this angel has one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea, which means God is in control of the populated areas of the world and the unpopulated areas of the world. In the civilized and uncivilized world, he's in control of the good times and the bad times and the sweet times and the bitter times. God is in total control. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is co-leader, the co-throne. They are sitting on the throne together, reigning and ruling. God wants you to know I've got this for you, but you're going to have to eat that book. Don't worry about what tomorrow holds. Focus on today. Try not to focus on the pain, but focus on me. Don't focus on the sin. You focus on the sin, it just makes you a greater sinner. You focus on a savior and you'll get victory over that sin. We have to be willing to do what God has asked us to do as a church and individuals. Look, he did not ask John if he wanted to first taste the book. He just says you need to eat the book. He did not ask him if he wanted to sample it a little bit. You know what, John? Taste a little bite and see if you want to eat the book or not. No, he just says, eat the book. John asks for the book. God gives him the book. You wanted to be a Christian. You wanted to obey God. You wanted to come into the church. You wanted to be saved. God gives you the book. Okay, here it is. Now eat it. Yeah, but Lord... I didn't know it was going to have such a bitter aftertaste. But God, I didn't realize sometimes it was going to be so bitter that I was going to have to put up with some of the pain that exists in the church. I, I loved it when it was sweet, but when I learned how God loves me unconditionally. I I loved it when I learned that I was saved by grace that was so sweet, but, but when I discovered That your love is a changing love. It's a jealous love and it's starting to revolutionize the way I live and it hurts and it's it's exposing all my false gods and it hurts and it's toppling all the things off the pedestal of my life and it hurts. The love is changing my life and it hurts. It's bitter. It's readjusting my priorities. It has a bearing on everything from the way I live to what I eat. To to what I say, I have to admit it, God, things are starting to taste a little bitter. But friends, by now in your life, I hope you realize there is no one that's just going to be skipping into the kingdom. There's a good chance you're going to have to go through some hell before you get to heaven. You see, God's words after we sinned were pretty clear. Pain would become a reality of life, but the good news to our hearts is God has absorbed our greatest pain. Because Jesus absorbed the only thing that could really ever completely destroy us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. John eats the book, He now has an upset stomach. He's as sick as a dog. But what does God command in verse 11? Verse 11, and I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. God does not tell John, okay, John, you don't feel so good. Man, why don't you just take a little nap? You know, lay down. You know, he he doesn't tell him to take a break. He says you must again prophesy. Basically, he tells John, John, you don't feel good? Go to work. Your stomach's upset? Go to work. Pastor, I didn't know it was going to be this rough in the church, but God says, go to work. When the followers of William Miller first began to piece the puzzle of prophecy together, it was sweet, friends. Hallelujah. Jesus, the King, is coming. Amen? It was sweet. But then October 22, 1844 came, and it wasn't so sweet anymore. 
Notice this quote by William Miller. It's really a heartbreaking letter. He says, I waited all Tuesday, October 22, and dear Jesus did not come. I waited all the forenoon of Wednesday and was well in, in body as I ever was, but after 12 o'clock I began to feel faint, and before dark I needed someone to help me up to my chamber as my natural strength was leaving me very fast, and I lay prostrate for two days sick with disappointment, bitter. But hallelujah, God did not give up on these eager Christians, amen? He commanded to them, just as he commanded to John, you must again prophesy about many people, nations, languages, and kings. Even though it's tough. Even though you're misunderstood. Even though things maybe haven't worked out the way you'd like them to work out. Keep fighting the good fight and get to work. You need to keep on keeping the Sabbath. And keep on coming to church. And keep on paying your tithe. And keep on preaching the good news. And keep on building my church. Go to work. Do not sit at home because the pastor said something you did not like. Do not stay at home because you're discouraged. Let me tell you, the last place you want to be is, uh, when you are discouraged, is at home by yourself. There's a saying that, that we used to say in 12-step in recovery, and that is, if you're, in, if you're alone, you're in terrible company. You're in terrible company. Well, I can worship God at home. You can't worship God at home like you can worship God at church. Because when you only worship at home, you are getting a very small sliver of the image of God. But when you come to a church, an assembly of people, and uh, you got the melancholies there, and the cholerics there, and the sanguines there, and the phlegmatics there, you got these different temperaments and these different people who are reflecting the image of God in a different way. Now that is how you can come together and worship God. It cuts through the denial. Don't stay at home. Don't stop coming to church because someone said something or didn't say something or they put their foot in their mouth. Listen to me. We need to stop letting the devil dictate when we come to church and when we serve the church. There are people who did not come to camp meeting because of things that were going around about a certain speaker of camp meeting. Who won in that equation? Jesus is the winner. And those who follow Jesus are winners. Don't let the devil dictate whether or not you come to camp meeting. You come to camp meeting and you shine the truth of Jesus. Jesus says, I know it may be bitter sometimes, but you need to go to work. Don't you see in these last days that you're going to discover what you have built your house upon? Have you built it on your wisdom, your knowledge, your theology, or have you built it up on the rock of ages? You see, God knows what you're made of, but do you need to know, but do you know what you're made of? And so in these last days, God is going to be showing you what you have built your house on. And too much of our faith is based on circumstance instead of Christ. There's too many of us aff affiliating ourselves with this train of thought or that train of thought. Man, I am affiliating myself with the word of God. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 4.14. And friends, this rebuke goes to both sides and ends of the spectrum. There will be many so that we may no longer be what? Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. But according to Ephesians 4.15, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Into who? Christ Jesus. Friends, we need to grow in Christ. And in order to grow in Christ, guess what? You are going to experience some growing pains. There are going to be people who say things you do not like. There are going to be preachers who preach sermons you do not like. There are going to be members who say things that you do not like. But guess what? If you're going to grow in Christ, there are going to be something called growing pains. You know, I remember when I was growing up as a young man, waking up in the middle of the night, uh, because my legs would be aching so bad. And I would call out to my mom. I'd say, Mom, Mom, my, my legs are aching so bad. 
And she would come to my room, and, and you know what she would tell me? She'd say, son, those are growing pains. I used to think she made that up. I used to think that was something moms just tell their sons because they didn't know what was wrong with me. I said, growing pains, really? Growing pains, ma? But something went, but, but, but then I stopped growing, and guess what? The pain went away. So now when my kids call out to me in the middle of the night, Dad, my legs hurt, I go up to them and I tell them, oh, it's just growing pains. <laughs> Friends, growing pains are real. God allows us to experience growing pains that we may grow to our full height in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, eat the book. Pastor, I have to resign from my current church position. I'm just too busy. No, you just need to eat the book. Pastor, I don't want to come to church because someone offended me. Eat the book and get to church. Man, we need to stand up. We need to be counted. We need to be men and women of God. We need to get to work. This is the kind of church Christ is asking us to be. I will be faithful. I will be dedicated. I will sacrifice. I will not be shaken. I'm going to eat that book no matter how bitter it is it's at, at times. Saying amen to a sermon is easy, but living a sermon is hard. And friends, Isaiah tells us that the enemy comes in like a flood. He will attack and he will attack from, he, he attacks from the super religious and the air religious. He attacks from, from all sides, all fronts, people who have always been in the church and people who have never been in the church. The devil knows us so well, he sends people to us that get on our nerves. I mean, he just lines them up for us on Sabbath. And so we want to leave church, and we leave church muttering under our breath. You know what? I don't need to take that abuse. I don't need to go to this church. I'll just go to that other church down the road. I don't need to be subjected to that. Well, according to the Bible, you ate the book. So yeah, you do. The seven thunders say that stuff is coming, but are you ready? It's time for the church to turn the world upside down for God. Amen? Amen. No more wishy-washy commitment, man. Get on fire for God and shock the world and shock the devil. Man, even shock ourselves as we die to this world and we come alive in Christ. And man, when the king comes, hallelujah, we're going to be saved. But you see, God only knows what you need in order to be saved. And when people say, well, I don't need all that to be saved... I think to myself, how do you not know that is not exactly what you need in order to be saved? Since when did you become the author and the finisher of your salvation? Eat the book. It may taste bitter, but I'm eating it, friends. Yeah, but God, you never said anything about cancer in that book. You never said anything about depression in that book. You never said anything about bipolar disorder in that book or people so messed up that they dismember uh, children who proclaim their loyalty to Christ. You never said anything about vehicular manslaughter and drug addiction in that book. It was in the seven thunders. So how can we make it through the bitterness? I'll tell you how. Friends, we need to see how Jesus Christ absorbed the ultimate bitterness. So that rather than being recipients of, 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 of his total justice, we might be the ultimate recipients of his grace. By seeing how on the cross Jesus was completely forsaken so that you and I never have to be. I mean, if anyone had to swallow a bitter pill, it was Jesus Christ on the cross. Man, he paid a debt. He did not have to owe. You want to talk about a bitter pill, Jesus had to swallow it. And yet he was, he was not bitter about it at all. He willingly went to the cross and he ate that book. And friends, when Jesus Christ looked down from the cross, he did not think. When he looked down at you from the cross, he did not th think, oh, I'm giving myself to you because you are so sweet to me. Jesus did not look down from the cross and think, I'm giving myself to you because you make me feel good about myself. 
Jesus didn't look down from the cross and say, I'm giving myself to you because you make me laugh. No, he was in agony and he looked down from the cross and we denied him and we abandoned him and we betrayed him. And when he asked for water to drink, we gave him something bitter instead. And yet in the greatest act of love in the history of the world, Jesus still stayed committed to us. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He loved us, friends, not because we were lovely to him. Jesus loved us in order to make us lovely. Man, he ate the ultimate bitter book for you and for me. Life may have those moments that are hard to swallow. Man, just eat it. Eat it and see him high and lifted up and see his total commitment, his total solid commitment to you. See how he absorbed the only thing that could ever really destroy us. See how he swallowed up death so that one day you can have eternal life. The king is coming, amen? Amen. The king is coming. I don't know about you, but I long for that day. And so I'm going to eat the book, no matter how bitter it is, and I'm going to get to work. Let's finish the work together, amen? Let's spread the good news together, amen? Because there is a sick world out there, and there are people going to Christless graves out there. So let's preach the gospel and go home. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. That although sometimes life is bitter, because we put our ultimate faith and trust in you, we know that the bitterness won't last forever. That very soon, the most sweet experience the mind cannot even fathom right now is going to come true. We're going to experience it. Lord, we long for that day. And just as those Millerites who were terribly disappointed, and yet you came back to that movement of people and you said, get to work, I've got more to show you. Lord, we want to be willing to do the same today. That in spite of the flaws of of misinterpreting prophecy and date setting, one thing they did do, those Millerites, is they did live their lives as though Jesus was going to be coming soon. Lord, sometimes we say it all the time, but or the way we live, the way I live. And so I just, I pray for you to empower me with your Holy Spirit to truly live as though the King is coming. And we will not keep the gospel a secret if we really believe that you are coming. Lord, be with us, guide us, direct us. Help every person here to know that regardless of how bitter life is, you are still in control. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.